In this video, we're going to look at the n plus 1 rule for determining the splitting patterns due to a given number of adjacent protons in NMR. So I have a sample molecule here, and this is, let's see, an ethane with three bromines total, two of them at, proton, at carbon 1, two of them at carbon 2, so this would be 112 tribromoethane. This has three protons, H, H, H. We have one attached to carbon 1 and it is next to two bromines which are fairly electronegative so this is going to be at a higher chemical shift than these protons which are next to one bromine so that's why this is proton one here and these are proton two protons two on the uh, on our spectrum and we have this proton one is next to two chemically equivalent protons and it splits into this pattern that we call a triplet here and we have our two chemically equivalent protons on carbon 2, which are next to carbon 1, and they split into what we call a doublet here. And as we can see on the spectrum, I also have these peaks integrated. This integrates to, this peak integrates to twice the value that this one does, so this is our two protons, and this one is our one proton. Okay, so we want to explain why we observe this type of pattern, why when you're next door to a single proton, you split into a doublet, why when you're next door to two protons you split into a triplet, and then etc. beyond that. So let's look first at the case of the doublet. So we're going to be next door to one uh, given proton. And that proton can either be spin up or it can be spin down. And at any given time it's pretty much equally likely that it's either going to be spin up or spin down. NMR energy levels are very, very small in terms of their energy differences. So their populations at room temperature are pretty much equal. There's, there's only a few parts per million difference. So it's about half and half that they're going to be spin up or spin down. So that'll give us a ratio of pretty much one to one of whether our neighboring proton is going to be spin up or spin down when these protons undergo their transition, their resonance frequency. And of course that being spin up or spin down creates an external magnetic field. It's going to interact with the magnetic dipoles of these protons here and it's going to affect the energy levels of these protons as described in our previous videos on spin-spin coupling. So that result, that pattern results in a doublet because we have the we have the energy levels affected by that up and down state and as I had there that ends up being called a doublet and it's one to one and on the spectrum you see two peaks generally which are of about equivalent size. Okay and then if we extend this to more protons so let's say that we have uh, look at it from perspective of proton one. It has two protons next door. So what possible states could it be in? Well, they could be both spin up. They could have spin up or spin down and spin down, spin up. So there's two states possible where one of them is spin up and one of them is spin down and or they could both be spin down. And these will each affect the energy levels of proton 1 to a varying degree. You can either have them uh, cha changed a lot in this direction, changed a lot in the opposite direction, or you can have the effects pretty much cancel out. So this leads to a splitting pattern of 1 to 2 to 1, and there's going to be, as we saw, three distinct uh, energy transitions. This is just a this is just works out like the same math of the first order perturbation theory we did for a doublet calculation. It's just adding in another spin. It gets more complicated in terms of the algebra, but if you work it out, there's really no difference. So this type of situation being called a triplet, and this one to two to one pattern, usually on a spectrum, you'll see peaks in that type of arrangement, one to two to one. They don't have to necessarily be that in terms of the height, so the heights won't always be exactly that, that, that type of ratio, but the integration of the individual peaks should be much closer to that value than the heights are going to be, especially if you've got a spectrum which is good enough to actually resolve these peaks individually to where you can see it on the integration. Okay, then uh, extending this to its natural conclusion, it goes further on. If we have three spins, there's four different um, kind of sets. We can have all three spin up. 
We can have the states where two of them are spin up and one is spin down. So we could have up, up, down, up, down, up, or down, up, up. So three states where you have two spin up and one spin down. Three states where you have one spin up and two spin down. So down, up, down, 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 up, down, and down, down, up. And then there's only one state where all three are spin down. So this comes out to be an intensity of 1 to 3 to 3 to 1. And because you have four distinct states there, what you end up getting is a pattern called a quartet. And on a spectrum, that appears in a ratio of 1 to 3 to 3 to 1, something like that. So this would be a pattern you'd expect to see if you were split by a neighboring uh, single proton if it's a neighboring uh, methylene group with two protons into a triplet, and if you're next to a methyl group, perhaps a quartet. And you'll notice that in each of these cases, what we have is we have N adjacent protons splitting the peak of a given proton results in N plus 1 peaks. And this is why we refer to this as the n plus 1 rule. Because one proton splits you into uh, two different transition energy levels. Two splits you to three. Three splits you to four. And et cetera beyond that. And the pattern goes on and on and on. And you could continue this analysis as far as you wanted to go until it just becomes uh, less chemically relevant and more just kind of a math exercise. You can go to a quintet, 1 to 4 to 6 to 4 to 1, if you build out this actual tree here. You can go to a sextet, 1 to 5 to 10 to 10 to 5 to 1 for those peak ratios for quintet and sextet. Let's see if I can actually draw these here. Let's test my abilities. Let's see, 1 to 4... One, two, three, four, to six is 50% larger than that one. Ah, that kind of blurred into each other. It's going to be tough with me trying to do artwork here. It's going to be an uphill battle. All right, not going so well, so maybe we'll just leave that out. Okay, but you get the point that these patterns will observe this type of a behavior right there. So this is the n plus 1 rule. You might ask yourself, where is it going to come up that I'll have six adjacent chemically equivalent protons? Because a quartet comes from a methyl group. Uh, carbons can only have four, uh, four atoms bonded to them, and one of them obviously has to be the carbon linking back to the uh, proton that I'm, that I'm computing this peak for. But you could have a situation where you have a proton here, and then imagine these are both methyl groups. And in this situation, if I replace these with methyl groups, uh, they would be chemically equivalent. So I could have three here and three there, but they're, since they're chemically equivalent, I have six pro chemically equivalent protons adjacent to this one. And that, well, actually, that, that, would be, that would be n plus one, six plus one would be seven. That would be a septet, which is even further along than this one. But this pattern, this... Uh, the splitting pattern here is what's called binomial coefficients, and they also obey what's called Pascal's triangle, where you continue generating ones on the outside, but whenever you have inside elements, you sum the two groups to the left and to the right. So binomial coefficients, or Pascal's triangle, actually generate what these, what these intensity patterns are going to be for, this, for a given n plus 1 uh, set of peaks there. So I'll just write that down that you can look up these either in terms of binomial coefficients. If you like probability and statistics, you should be very familiar with those. Or we can also look these up from Pascal's triangle.